So thank you for coming. I hope you find this topic interesting. This is a two-year-old beagle that had a three-day history of neck pain and reluctance to walk. So as you watch this video, think about just from observing this dog, where would you localize this lesion? Just from observation. And then based on where you think the lesion localization is, what sort of differentials would you think about? One of the things that I really like about neurology is we can often get a pretty good idea of where this patient's lesion is just by watching them in the exam room, walking around. This is an eight-year-old poodle with a two-day history of anorexia, ataxia, a head tilt, and the signs have been progressing rapidly. So we don't torture animals, but it looks like we do sometimes. So. But just again, from watching this video, <clears throat> you may not be able to get the exact lesion localization, but you should have a pretty good idea. And so what sort of differentials would you have just based on that history and the signalment? And then this is a four-year-old female spade terrier <clears throat> who came in with a two-week history of decreased activity, generalized seizures, and circling. What do all these cases have in common? The main thing is that inflammatory disease is an important differential for all of these patients. Inflammatory disease is described in terms of what part of the nervous system is affected. Meningitis is inflammation of the meninges. Encephalitis is inflammation of the brain. Myelitis is inflammation of the spinal cord. And these can occur as separate entities or they can occur in combination. Sometimes all of them are involved. So we can have a meningoencephalomyelitis. An important thing to be aware of and uh, it's a common question I still get asked is how often do we see infections in the, the nervous system? And it's not commonly at all. It's much more common that we're dealing with non-infectious um, inflammatory diseases in the nervous system. Most inflammatory diseases have an acute onset and a progressive nature. So other things that can have an acute onset are vascular diseases and trauma, but those aren't progressive. So I'd say the other condition that tends to have um, more of a similar onset and progression would be neoplasia. So that's often a top um, differential for patients that have this sort of presentation. Inflammatory diseases tend to occur more often <clears throat> in young to middle-aged dogs. And so other diseases that you might consider, things like storage diseases, hydrocephalus, hepatic encephalopathy, and then we always have neoplasia on the differential list. Dogs with inflammatory CNS diseases are often not systemically ill, but they may have nonspecific signs, such as lethargy, anorexia, um, pain, which sometimes can be hard to localize. The most important part of the neuro exam um, when these patients come in is to try to localize the lesion. That should be the first thing before coming up with differentials. After you do your exam, you should ask yourself, where is this patient's lesion? And the hallmark of inflammatory disease is often that it's multifocal. Sometimes you can't localize it to one specific area. When we're dealing with intracranial diseases, we kind of break it down into two main areas. We have the forebrain, basically your cerebrum, and the brainstem. And the signs related to problems in those parts of the brain are, are pretty characteristic. When it comes to forebrain lesions, kind of the hallmark of that is typically a dog that has a fairly normal gait, but may have proprioceptive deficits on exam. They often circle. Um, and these are typically the dogs that have um, pretty demented mentation. Um, and then seizures are the other big one that would localize your lesion to the forebrain.
Some of the main signs that would give you a localization to the brainstem would be a head tilt. Significant ataxia is usually going to be seen only with brainstem lesions. So if you have an animal that comes in and it's having seizures but is also has a head tilt or significantly ataxic, then you have a multifocal localization. Some of the more common signs seen in dogs with inflammatory disease are listed here. So again, it really depends on what part of the nervous system is involved, um, and often it's multiple parts. We can see neck pain in a lot of these guys, and it doesn't always mean that there's cervical involvement. You can see it just with intracranial disease due to increased pressure and stretching of the meninges. So with most other things, these patients come in, you're going to want to do a minimum database to try to help rule out other causes of neurological signs. And majority of these dogs are going to have normal, basic blood work. Other things, depending on the signalment, the history that you might consider doing, are things like bile acids, potentially infectious disease testing, and potentially chest or abdominal imaging. A lot of it, you don't do those on every patient, but it depends on what your suspicion is of other diseases. Ultimately, we're often looking at the advanced imaging like MRI and CSF analysis to get diagnoses in these cases. When it comes to diagnosing inflammatory disease, CSF is very important. And there are a few diseases where it's the only test that needs to be done, um, but often it's done in combination with imaging to really put together the whole picture. In about 10% of inflammatory diseases like GME, you're going to have a normal CSF. So a normal CSF doesn't always rule it out, but it's, it's a sensitive test to look for inflammatory disease. So there's two places um, for us to collect fluid from, either um, the cisterna magna, which is between the skull and C1, or the lumbar spine. Most of the time, other than a few diseases we'll talk about, we usually image first and then tap afterwards, because there can be instances where doing a CSF tap is, is going to be very risky or contraindicated. Um, the big one would be if there's a tumor. If we see a, a definitive tumor, we don't tap because um, it can be risky and also it doesn't give me any more information. In this example up here, I don't know if you can see very well, this is a dog with a brain tumor and he also has herniation of both the cerebrum and the cerebellum. So in a case like this, we don't want to do a CSF tap. Doing a tap doesn't require any real specialized equipment other than spinal needles, which I don't know if everyone has those in practice or that'd be something you wouldn't necessarily have. When I'm doing a tap on a small dog or even a cat, I'll just use a 22 gauge needle with no stylet. So a dog, say under 10 pounds, I wouldn't use a spinal needle, I'd just use a 22 gauge needle. So the other place besides the cisterna magna we can get fluid from is from the lumbar space. And I think maybe some people feel a little bit more comfortable trying that because you're not right up next to the brain. But it's, it's typically a lot more difficult to collect CSF from a lumbar tap. Um, you often get, have a higher risk of blood contamination, so it can be harder to interpret your results. So this is a short video showing a, a tap on a, a pit bull. So if you're right-handed, you'd place the patient in right lateral and you'd shave your area. Your landmarks are going to be the occipital protuberance to basically show you where midline is, the back of the skull, and then the wings of the atlas. And essentially, if you draw a triangle between those three points, you'd go right in the middle. Once you shave, do a quick prep. I palpate with my left hand, advance the needle with the right. Again, if it's a small dog, I would just use a regular needle and just advance very slowly until fluid comes out. Once you're in the right spot, fluid usually comes out pretty quickly. Um, if it's a big dog, usually you'll feel several pops because you're going through different fascial planes until you get into the right spot. Most of the time, the fluid doesn't look as obviously abnormal as it is in this patient. This is a dog that had steroid-responsive meningitis. Um, more often than not, the fluid looks normal, but can still, you can still get very abnormal results. The other main part of diagnosing these diseases is imaging. Our two imaging modalities that we have are CT or MRI. CT is really good when it comes to looking at bone, 
looking at um, lungs. We can use it for things like hemorrhage in the brain after acute trauma, um, looking for fractures. Um, but the, the detail of the brain, and specifically the brain stem, is very poor with CT. And a lot of our inflammatory diseases really like to affect the brain stem. And we can have a really hard time seeing those on CT. So they, you can definitely miss inflammatory disease on a CT scan. So when it comes to looking at this, these diseases, MRI is by far the preferred modality. It's going to show us better detail. We can better see the kind of the extent of the disease. Other things that are sometimes on our differential list, um, like strokes, will usually show up on a MRI but not a CT. So overall, especially when it comes to looking at the brain, an MRI is a much better choice. The downsides are it does cost more, it does take a lot longer, a CT might take 10 minutes, an MRI is more like an hour to look at the brain. So it does take a good bit longer, so these patients are under anesthesia for a longer period, but we, we definitely get more information from it. So currently, I'm the, the person that runs our MRI, so when I'm not here, we don't have MRI, um, which can be difficult, but the good news is we have neuro another neurologist coming, and so we'll have MRI available hopefully more often, at least five days a week. Um, and then when one of us is out of town, that we'll still have MRI available. So as a very brief introduction to MRI, um, some of the more common scans that we do are called T1, T2, and flare images. And so T2 usually is going to really show our pathology. That's what this image is on the left. Um, on a T2 image, the, way, the simplest way to think about it is two things are going to be bright or white, and that's fluid and fat. So most lesions are going to lead to increase in fluid. So that's basically what we're seeing in the brain over here on the left. On um, the left side of the cerebrum is how it's brighter. There's a bunch of edema in the brain. And then T1 is mainly used so that we have something to compare to post-contrast. So on the top is a pre-contrast image. On the bottom is post-contrast. And you can see the enhancement pattern then. I don't think I, I don't have a flare up here, but a flare is another way of being able to highlight areas of fluid like edema and helping it stand out. So the hallmark of inflammatory disease is usually hyperintensity on T2, meaning we have this brighter areas that aren't supposed to be there um, that can variably enhance and are oftentimes pretty ill-defined. So just to give you some comparison, I'll show you some other MRIs of other diseases. This is an um, example of a pretty classic meningioma. It has very kind of uniformly enhancing they tend to occur in, in certain areas of the brain more than others. So this is a pretty classic appearance of what we see with an MRI on a, of a meningioma. So something like this, it'd be hard to misdiagnose this. This is a more classic appearance of a glioma. And these can sometimes have an unusual appearance. And there are times when we get an MRI and we can't tell, is this a tumor? Is this inflammatory disease? because gliomas can have variable enhancement. They sometimes are not as well defined as a tumor like a meningioma. This is an example of a pituitary macroadenoma. These are pretty easy to diagnose on an MRI. Obviously, they occur in the region of where the pituitary gland is, um, and they tend to have some other pretty well-defined characteristics. This is a um, pretty good example of a cerebellar stroke. This is what we see with those. Most of the time, they're going to have a different appearance than what we see with inflammatory disease. But again, there's, there's always some overlap between these. So there are times when we do an MRI and we say, well, we think this is a stroke. It's possible this is an inflammatory lesion. They're not always this clear cut. All right, so we're going to talk about some of the specific diseases. We're going to talk about steroid responsive meningitis, arteritis, eosinophilic meningoencephalomyelitis, the steroid responsive tremor syndrome, GME, NME, L NLE, and MUE. So steroid responsive meningitis arteritis, or SRMA, is going to be the most common form of meningitis seen in dogs. 
It's an immune-mediated reaction that's directed against the arteries and the meninges in the CNS. This is mainly seen in dogs around one year of age. I'd say more often in large breed dogs, although beagles are one of the breeds that we see this in more commonly. So I think of it as the three B dogs, or boxers, beagles, and Bernese mountain dogs. It's also been called beagle pain syndrome. If you've heard of that, that's what this is. So the most common presenting sign of this is neck pain. Sometimes they'll have TL pain as well. They typically don't have any gait deficits, and CP deficits are possible, but usually they're very mild if they are present. Some of these dogs will have a fever, but a lot of them won't. Some of them will have elevated white cell counts on CBCs, but a lot of them won't. So if they don't have that, don't discount this as a possibility. Imaging can be done for these dogs. Oftentimes it's normal. We, if we do see something, we may see some meningeal enhancement, um, but that can also be a normal finding in dogs. So this is one of those diseases that is often diagnosed based on CSF analysis alone. So these are those cases that come in that if you were comfortable doing a spinal tap, that that could be done and you could get a diagnosis. You wouldn't need imaging for these guys. So if a one-year-old boxer or Weimaraner comes to me with signs consistent with this, most of the time I would tap them first before imaging them unless they're, you know, I'm suspecting something else. And then if the tap were to come back normal, then we might move on to, to imaging. But we usually diagnose this based on CSF alone. Typically what we find is an elevation in neutrophils in the CSF. So it's called a neutrophilic pleocytosis. And these are the cases that usually have the highest white cell count of any of the inflammatory diseases that we see. The other big differential for seeing an elevation in neutrophils in the CSF is bacterial meningitis. And so obviously the treatment for this versus bacterial meningitis is very, very different. The big thing I'll say is bacterial meningitis is very, very rare. If I have a compatible breed, we see neutrophils, they're non-degenerative, I usually just treat for this. There is a um, second form of steroid response meningitis that is more chronic. These guys have a different finding on CSF. They tend to have more mononuclear cells instead of neutrophils. These are, tend to be cases that have been on steroids previously, but not long enough. So they can convert to more of a chronic form, which can be very difficult to treat. So this is a typical protocol I would use for a steroid responsive meningitis case. Most of the time, if you treat these guys appropriately, you can get them off of steroids completely. So this is one of those where they can um, go into remission and come off of drugs. And I usually just treat these guys with steroids um, alone. If they relapse, then I might add in another immunosuppressant. But for the first time around, I usually just treat with prednisone. So I know we're talking about sterile inflammatory diseases, but again, just wanted to put this up here because if you do a, a tap and you get neutrophils, this is your other differential, um, but it is very, very rare. If we're dealing with bacterial meningitis, we expect that the neutrophils might be degenerative. Um, you may see organisms. I've been lucky in the few cases of this I've diagnosed that the pathologist usually said they saw bacteria on the the cytology. When we do have a suspected case of this, the ideal treatment is going to be based off culture. Um, if we don't get a positive culture, then the recommended treatments are third generation cephalosporins, metronidazole, um, TMS is another option. And then with these, it, we still use steroids, but a very short course, like three to four days for these. And the survival for these is, is much worse than a steroid responsive. Another inflammatory disease that we can see is called eosinophilic meningitis. And so this is similar to SRMA, um, but it's not nearly as common. It's, but it has somewhat of a similar presentation. Um, it's usually young, large breed dogs. But the, the big difference is these guys sometimes have more severe neurological signs. So these guys can actually present 
with seizures, with some cranial nerve deficits, um, but they can present with just neck pain, like the steroid responsive meningitis dogs. And this is diagnosed by finding over 10% of the cells in the CSF being eosinophils, and it's never normal to find an eosinophil in the CSF. So anytime we see them, they're abnormal, but over 10% would be considered an eosinophilic pleocytosis. And the majority of these dogs don't have um, elevated eosinophils on their CBC. So that doesn't necessarily help you. The other differential for finding eosinophils in the CSF are fungal diseases or protozoal diseases. And the big difference is with the idiopathic eosinophilic meningitis, the prognosis is very good. Even though these guys can present with some pretty severe signs, um, the prognosis can be very good unless it's infectious, in which case there's almost 100% um, fatality rate. So I would assume this is something that everyone has seen in practice at some point. The corticosteroid responsive tremor syndrome or your little white shakers, cerebellitis is another term that's been used for this. Most of these dogs are less than five years of age um, and less than 15 kilograms. And the hallmark is a whole body tremor that gets worse with excitement, tends to lessen um, with rest, although some of these guys, even when they're sleeping, um, they're, they still have this tremor. This disorder is actually caused by a low-grade encephalitis, mainly affecting the cerebellum. The CSF may show a mild increase in lymphocytes, but it can be normal. Most of the time, I treat these guys based on their symptoms. Unless there's something unusual about them, we don't always work them up with a imaging or a tap, because um, there's not a lot of other things that are gonna cause constant tremors like this. The other big differential would be a toxin, if you saw something like this. And so usually I'll treat them um, based on symptoms. The prognosis is very good if treated appropriately. So they're treated with steroids, again, um, starting at like a one to two mg per kg per day dose of PRED until their signs resolve. Once the tremor stops, then you slowly taper. So usually taper over a few months. And these guys sometimes will do, seem to get better a little quicker if you add an oral Valium to their treatment. All right, we're gonna move on to GME. So GME was first documented in 1962. At that time, it was called reticulosis. And this is not a, a rare disease, as much as some people still maybe haven't seen this. There's probably, if you haven't seen this, there's probably cases that you're missing, because um, I think this is more common um, than we thought now with MRI, we see a lot more of these cases. Um, these typically have a very acute onset, they're progressive, and if left untreated, it's fatal. Females and toy and terrier breeds are the most common that are affected. The median age or mean age um, is about four and a half years of age. And this tends to affect um, both the forebrain and the brainstem. So we're often seeing seizures, um, visual deficits, vestibular signs. There's three forms, kind of separate forms that have been reported. There's a disseminated form, which is multifocal and affecting, again, the, the forebrain and the brainstem. Um, this is the most common form. We can see a form that just um, affects the optic nerves. And then there's a focal form, which can present more like a tumor. Is it basically these dogs form granulomas and it can mimic a mass in their brain. So the ocular form tends to present as an acute onset of blindness with dilated unresponsive pupils and it can become disseminated. A definitive diagnosis of GME is really only made on biopsy, which is not commonly done at all. It's not something that I do. Um, there's a few places that are doing this. There's some universities now that have a, a new biopsy system where they can biopsy these guys while they're getting MRI. That's still not commonly done, but that's the only way to, to have an official diagnosis of this. But with the, the history, the signalment, the imaging, um, we can feel pretty comfortable saying this dog has presumptive GME.
this is an example of what we might see on MRI in these cases. So up here in the top left, this is a T1 weighted image before contrast. And then in the top right is after we gave contrast. And you can see all the enhancement, mainly in the brainstem. And then on the bottom left is one showing the enhancement in the cerebrum. And then this is a, an axial or a transverse slice where you can see the enhancement both in the brainstem and then there's a little spot up here of enhancement. So this is a pretty common MRI of a dog with something like GME, where we see these kind of multiple lesions that often will take up some contrast. This is an MRI from a dog that actually presented for just signs compatible with the ocular form. And then once we imaged the dog, we found that he had some changes in the brain stem as well as up here in the cerebrum. And so even though they're subtle, they're there. And the, the degree of changes on the MRI doesn't always correlate with the signs. Some of the more severely affected dogs that I've seen come in and the changes on MRI are not very impressive. And then I've had other dogs come in that you can't believe they're alive based on what you see on the MRI. This is just an example of what's called the flare image. So it helps to distinguish areas of like edema from areas of other types of fluid like CSF. So if we look up here, here's the lateral ventricles that are nice and bright. And then there's this area of inflammation next to it, which is a little hard to appreciate. And then if you do a flare, it takes the CSF and turns it dark. So then other types of fluid like edema will stand out more. So GME is a disease that primarily affects the white matter of the brain and it can affect the spinal cord as well. And what we see on histopath is these cuffs of inflammatory cells that form granulomas, mainly around vessels. And it's not known if these inflammatory cells come from migration from other areas or if it's local proliferation of inflammatory cells that are already present in the brain. There's still a lot about GME that's not known. So necrotizing meningoencephalitis is similar to GME. Um, the big difference is um, the pathologic findings. And thus far, it's been documented mainly in pugs. So it's also called, was called pug dog encephalitis or PDE. Um, that's what this is. Um, the other breeds that it's been found in are Chihuahuas, Maltese's, and Pomeranians. These dogs tend to be a little bit younger as far as when the clinical signs start. Instead of GME was around four, four and a half. Um, this tends to be the average age is two and a half. And this disease tends to be mainly affecting the cerebral hemispheres. So we don't see much brainstem involvement. So these guys present more with things like seizures, altered mentation. The other necrotizing um, disease is called necrotizing leukoencephalitis. And this tends to affect mainly the white matter, as the name would imply. And it affects the cerebrum and the brainstem. So similar to GME, um, and this has a pretty similar age of onset. This has, was initially recognized in Yorkies, um, but it's also been found in French Bulldogs, is the other main breed. And this disease, it can have a very acute onset like the others, but there's also a more chronic form that we can see. So these are um, two examples of NME and NLE. On the left is NME, where you can see the, all the edema or inflammation in the cerebrum over here. And then over here, this big white area that's not supposed to be there. So in the middle, we have the lateral ventricles, and then this big white area is an area of necrosis or cavitation. And this is just a, another example of NME and showing how, again, the flare, it can highlight this edema more. So with dogs that have subtle lesions that are hard to see on other images, we use the flare to show those. And this is the um, necrotizing leukoencephalitis. So again, here's the area of cavitation here in the brain. And some of these guys, again, surprise me. You see these large cavitations in their brain, and their signs aren't always that bad.
So the other term that is used is meningoencephalitis of unknown etiology. And basically what that is is that's describing these cases that we have diagnosed with a suspected immune-mediated encephalitis, but we don't have a histopath diagnosis on. So if you are doing any reading and you come across this term MUE or meningoencephalitis of unknown etiology, it's, it implies that we suspect this is autoimmune, but we don't have the histopath diagnosis for these. Occasionally, this is still the diagnosis, even after histopath, if the, um, the findings don't fit within what is expected for GME or NME or NLE. The prognosis for these diseases other than SRMA, steroid responsive tremor syndrome, the eosinophilic meningoencephalitis um, has historically thought to have been pretty poor, especially I will have clients come in. I think it's pretty easy for them to go online and do some reading about GME. And if they go online and they try to read specifically about GME, it seems like they often come across some of the studies that were published a while ago that report median survival time for disseminated GME is eight days. And I think these times are very skewed. These were based on you know, histopath diagnoses, so these were based on necropsies. I think we, they were looking at you know, the worst cases. And so what I typically tell people for these is with treatment, if the dogs respond to treatment in the first week or two, that a lot of these dogs go on to live several years but it's a lifelong treatment. If it's other than, again, SRMA or the steroid reflux tremor syndrome, GME, NME, NLE, MUE, these dogs are on treatment for the rest of their life. The main treatment is always gonna be steroids and then potentially other medications, depending on what disease you're dealing with. If you're not sure if this is autoimmune, we're waiting on titers, you might uh, start antibiotics while you're waiting, but ultimately these dogs are gonna need steroids in pretty high dosages. And in order to get them down to lower dosages, we will often put them on a second immunosuppressive drug. So my first choice for treating these guys that need a second drug is cytosine arabinoside. And this is a chemotherapy drug it's used sometimes for lymphoma, especially if it's in the CNS. Um, we use it a lot for GME, suspected GME. I like this drug because most dogs tend to tolerate it really well. It has minimal side effects. It seems to be effective for these guys. The downsides to it is they have to come in to get an injection. It's sub-Q, so it's easy to give, but they have to come in and get this every few weeks. Initially, we'll start out giving this every three to four weeks. If they're doing well after a few months, we might try to increase the interval between injections. A lot of clients oftentimes don't want to do that. After their dog's doing really well, they came in, and they, you know, they thought they were gonna die when they came in and then they end up responding to treatment, they don't wanna change the interval. And they'll often just say, let's just stick with this. This is working. You know, I don't mind coming in monthly for these injections. I do have some clients who take the injection for a second day home and give it if they live like an hour away and they don't wanna come back and forth because it is done two days in a row. And then I have some people who've come from a few hours away, they can't come in monthly for these, and their primary veterinarian will, will order this and do it at their clinic if they feel comfortable with it. I'd say for most dogs with GME, they're usually pretty small breed dogs, I'd say we're, we're often looking at client costs, about $150 a month for them to come in and get the two injections. So it's not super cheap, so if they, that's the other thing to take into consideration. One of the other drugs that's used often to treat these guys is cyclosporin. And cyclosporin has pretty poor blood-brain barrier penetration, but it, it concentrates within the cerebral endothelial cells, which is where GME is primarily located. So that's one of the reasons why it's thought that um, it works well for that disease. Oftentimes also, because of all the inflammation, the blood-brain barrier is thought to not be completely intact 
So this is my second choice for dogs that can't come in monthly to do the cytosine injections or they can't afford it. We'll often go to cyclosporin. And I will admit, since a lot of people, if they can't afford to come in for the cytosine and they have a tight budget, we'll often call in generic cyclosporin and not do the atopica. So we'll call it in to somewhere like Wedgwood or Diamondback and just go towards the higher end of the dose. And they seem to tolerate it really well. I think it's a pretty effective treatment. Azathioprine is also commonly used, and there have been some studies looking at this which have shown um, some pretty long survival times. I've used azathioprine quite a bit because it's pretty cheap, but I've had enough dogs that have developed hepatotoxicity on it that it's not one of my first choices. But if it's something that you're comfortable with, you use it for other immune-mediated diseases, um, it's certainly an option to use. Mycophenolate is another immunosuppressive drug that we can use for this. And this one seems to um, be very well tolerated. It's pretty affordable. And I often use this in combination with some of the other, with another immunosuppressant and PRAD. So if I have a dog that's failing something else, I might add this in, and then we can get a little bit better control and still be able to wean down their steroids. Leflunamide is another drug that I like a lot for this. The downside to this drug is I have a few patients who are currently on this and it's become a little bit harder to find. Um, I've had clients tell me where you were calling it in, the price you know, tripled recently and then we have to try to find a new pharmacy to get it from. So it seemed like it wasn't that expensive and then the price will go up, it seems like, periodically. But it tends to be pretty well tolerated is the nice thing and seems to be pretty effective. Lomustine is another drug that um, can be used. This is a chemotherapy drug. I have used this a few times, not that often. I have seen with this definitely more side effects. You have to do more monitoring, more like you're truly using a chemotherapy drug versus the cytosine. I have not seen a patient become myelosuppressed with cytosine, um, even at higher dosages than what's published, but with with this, I've, I've had a few patients um, that have become myelosuppressed. Procarbazine was a drug that when we became more and more aware of GME and these types of diseases, um, that was talked about initially, and this is a chemotherapy drug. It's not used, I'd say, that often anymore. If I have a patient that we've gone through some of the other drugs and either they aren't responding or there's side effects that they've had to some of these other drugs, then this is another option that we have. And radiation therapy has been reported as a possible treatment. More likely um, for focal GME, it would be useful. The downside is we don't have that available here. So for people to travel to somewhere like Knoxville or Atlanta to get radiation um, for this when we have other options that usually are effective. I'd say this is pretty rarely done. And then just for fun, I thought we'd throw in one slide about cats. <laughs> it's not that we can't see autoimmune encephalitis in cats, but it's really, really rare. So the opposite is true in cats. If we're dealing with encephalitis, we assume it's infectious until proven otherwise. And the two big ones that we think about in cats are FIP and cryptococcus when it comes to encephalitis. So there are times when we can't find a cause, but it's still thought that immune-mediated CNS disease in cats is really, really rare. We finished really early. <laughs> so hopefully no one's disappointed. This is my crew, and this is my new one, who's only good when she is asleep. Yes. I talked to you the other day about the C-reactive protein test. Yes. Do you ever run that, or does it not differentiate any? It doesn't, it's not a definitive diagnosis. I'd say the most useful thing with that test is monitoring for relapse of meningitis. So we've had some, or I've had some patients that I diagnosed with SRMA, and you're treating them, and they're either off steroids or on low doses, 
and the owners might say, you know, they seem a little lethargic. You're not sure. Are they truly having a relapse? Do we need to go up on our steroids, or is it okay to continue to wean? Um, and you can use that test as a way, if it's still elevated, to say, okay, I don't think we're at a point where you're in remission, um, or if it's after they finish steroids, and you can check that, see if it's elevated. So it, it can help you more with that, because once you start steroids, again, you can't repeat the tap and use that as a way to tell if they're in remission or it's harder, and that's also a much more invasive thing to do. Most people don't want to repeat a CSF tap to tell if their dog's in remission. But yeah, it's not, I wouldn't use that over a CSF tap for initial diagnosis.